The fourth reason is very simple and direct. The Nicene Creed directly answers the question of all inquirers. It was written, I suppose, by the Holy Spirit who, who knew ahead of time that uh, a thousand years later, Christians would begin to have the problem of which church the church was going to split. And there's now well over 20,000 different churches, all of which claim to be the Church of Christ. How do you tell which is the true church? Well, the Nicene Creed gave you the four marks of the church. If you want to find which church is the Church of Christ, find which one has these four marks or signs. Miracles are signs in the New Testament. The Greek word for miracle means literally sign. Clues, marks. Clues are good enough reasons. They're not conclusive proofs like mathematical equations, but they're good enough reasons for anybody who really seeks. They're footprints, divine fingerprints, like the Messianic prophecies. Jesus said, if you really understood the God you worship, you'd understand me. Know my Father, know me. So like all evidence for God, I think it is adequate, but not so conclusive that you can't escape it if you're really looking for an escape hatch. The four marks of the church are, it is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Which church is one? Where does the unity of the Catholic Church come from? The one deposit of faith that it received at the beginning from Christ. And the church has throughout history taught one doctrine. It has always been faithful to that deposit of faith because that is absolute truth. That is from the lips of God incarnate. The church has claimed in that sense less than every other church. Namely, the church has claimed to be simply a mail carrier. Every other church has claimed to edit his mail. For instance, Protestants always ask me, how come the Catholic Church is the only church that's so cruel it will not allow divorce? I say, because we claim less authority than you. Christ clearly forbade divorce in all four Gospels, and we don't claim the authority to change the words of our Master. No matter what. The Pope used this kind of formulation in that document, which seems to be infallible, about no priestesses. He says, the church does not have the authority to ordain women since our Lord didn't. It's not that we have the authority to say no, but we don't have the authority to say yes. Now, there's all sorts of other questions that have to be answered about issues like that and pastoral questions too. But here is the non-negotiable absolute, the one. This unity has been expressed in history in a visible way. One pope, one vicar of Christ. The church is not a democracy. I, I rather like democracy uh, in politics. Uh, I think the divine right of kings is a confusion of church and state because there isn't any secular vicar of Christ. So the very reasons for democracy in politics, I think, are good reasons against it in the church. I think C.S. Lewis says somewhere, there's two reasons for preferring democracy. One, you think everybody is so good and wise, you ought to give them as much power as possible. Two, you think everybody is so wicked and foolish, you better not give any one person very much power at all. <laughs> That's a better one. Second mark of the church, it's holy. What does that mean? Perfect? Nope. A lot of Protestant churches try to be perfect, and when I was a Protestant, I knew a lot of bad Catholics, but very few bad Protestants, uh, and I thought that proved that the church wasn't holy, and then I realized that the church was not supposed to be a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. Holy means set apart. doesn't mean perfect. Set apart. The church is the exception to every rule. Look at all the different churches, and it's always the Catholic Church down through history that gets people excited and worried and sticks in their craw. And today, in the culture of death, who is the big enemy? The Catholic Church, of course. Who does the media fear and hate the most? Us. We're the, we're the new Jews. Throughout history, nobody's hated the Jews as much. Uh, nobody's hated anybody as much as the Jews. Why? They're unassimilated. They're holy. They're different. They're the chosen people. 
Oh, what a terrible thing to say. No, it's a humble thing to say. There's only two possible ways to explain their survival and their achievements. Either it's, it's their uh, virtue or it's God's. Either it's their genius or it's God's. Either they figured it out themselves or God just gave it to them. Well, we make exactly the same claim. We've been given this divine revelation so that we are, we are like an iron ball in the pit of the world's stomach. We cannot be digested. We cannot be assimilated. Third mark, Catholic, means universal. Universal in the sense that it includes everything. Whatever anybody else has got, we got. And it also means worldwide. There's a line in Chesterton. Isn't it a little strange for a Southern Baptist mis missionary to ask an outer Mongolian to become a Southern Baptist? Doesn't seem quite universal enough. The Catholic Church is universal in that it includes many different particular local churches and traditions. It's an organic body. It's not uniformity. It's a body with organs. Truth is symphonic, as Van Balthazar says. But this universally inclusive church, according to the Protestants, is the church invisible. Well, you look at the New Testament, and the church is not invisible any more than you are, any more than Christ is. If Christ is not invisible, if he is a concrete historical person, and if he invites Thomas to say, touch my wounds and see me, instead of simply retreat into your own invisible piety and uh, decide to believe in me, then the same has got to be true of his body. Because your body can't be less visible than you are. If Christ was visible, his body's visible. This notion of the invisible church, the merely invisible church, is, is not scriptural. But the clearest mark of the church is the fourth, apostolic succession. We are the church of the apostles. Here are three historical, empirical, undeniable facts. They're not theological, they're historical. Number one, Jesus Christ did in fact appoint apostles and said to them things like, whoever hears you, hears me. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Protestants have to admit that. That's a part of their scriptural data. Second historical fact, these apostles, exercising that authority given to them by Christ, did in fact appoint successors called bishops. Third historical fact, these bishops still exist in the Catholic Church in an unbroken line of historical continuity. That's as clear a sign as you could want. 